Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part two of the uh, challenges and diagnosis of the spleen. And we left off here at benign splenic tumors. And when you think about it, most splenic tumors that we do see are benign. Cis hemangiomas hematomas. So let me just show you some, because they really do have a very typical appearance. Cis, like cis in the liver and kidney, well defined, water density, sharply marginated. They're usually small, can be multiple, but they can be large. And in cases like this, when they're large, and they can be larger than this, they can compress the stomach and the patient could have symptoms. Sometimes you get stretching of the splenic capsule and that can be symptomatic. Sometimes you have mass effect in the stomach and that can be symptomatic. So it is possible that you could end up with a splenectomy even though you know it's gonna be a benign process. So again, very nicely shown in these examples. I mentioned cysts can be multiple, as in this example. And sometimes you see the cysts in a large spleen being multiple, or the spleen is enlarged because of the multiple cysts that are present, very nicely shown here. I do not know of an article that shows that the patient with multiple splenic cysts has an increased incidence of rupture, but I've never seen a case like that. Again, with multiple splenic lesions, the differential diagnosis ranges anywhere from cysts to metastasis to abscess to infarct. So being multiple doesn't help all that much. Also, when we talk about cystic lesions, hamartomas, cysts, maybe due to trauma, but some lesions, abscesses or lymphoma or mets can also be cystic and necrotic. So again, a simple cyst, well-defined water density, maybe a thin septation, but no definable wall. The others tend to have definable walls. When we talk about splenomegaly, again, the range from congestive changes to sequest such as sequestration to infection to sarcoid, many things give you a big spleen. So you can see how differential diagnosis, certain facts do help, but they may not be perfect. Now, in patients with pancreatitis, we can see splenic pseudocysts. That is, there's a bare area where the splenic artery and vein enter and the fluid can track there, and you get a pseudocyst. You can see here very much that subcapsular type appearance. Patients with this have increased risk of spontaneous splenic rupture with even minor trauma. So you wanna make sure these resolve, or if not, they will do a splenectomy. Just another pretty appearance of that. It can be due to old trauma, The most of the time we see it, it's due to pancreatitis. And again, the subcapsule location, the mass effect, are all gonna be classic, very nicely shown. When you see calcification of a splenic lesion, it's mostly due to old hematomas. In theory, sarcomas can have calcification, but that's like spotty or regular calcification. Rim-like calcification, anywhere I see that, I'm always thinking about old hematomas. In splenic hemangiomas, there are a number of different facts to remember. As I said, they may be similar to hepatic hemangiomas in terms of enhancement, but that's rare, that peripheral puddling, central filling in. Most of the time, they simply remain hypodense. Occasionally, they have calcifications. Most of the time, they're cystic and purely cystic. At times, they almost look like cysts, and there is an overlap between hemangiomas and hematomas, but there's some differences, and I'll show you that as well. Hemangiomas are the most common splenic tumor, and we can see multiple occasionally in a, in a regular patient, but particularly in Klippel Trinani Weber. Some examples here's hemangiomas, there's multiple peripheral enhancement, and then they fill in over time. Very classic for hemangioma. Here's another example peripheral puddling, and here you can see in the next set of images, it fills in over time. So that's very, very easy when you have this appearance. There is nothing really to think about, hemangioma. And those are the ones, but I would say that's 20% of the time. And here it is again with a few more images. Sometimes you have a ring-like appearance, again, filling in. Splenic hemangioma, no problem. But what about this case? There's a low-density lesion in the spleen. You can see it in the non-contrast, you see it well. So what could it be? You give contrast, there's some enhancement, but there's not the puddling. There's septations, better seen here. And then here it is again on the arterial phase and on the late phase. So now you see a low density lesion, there are some septations, there is some enhancement. That was a hemangioma, not classic. Or this example, very similar, low density, thin septations, 
it doesn't fill in at all, but again, the same type of thought process. Here it is with cinematic rendering. It's a low density lesion. Could it be a hamartoma? I guess it could. Could it be lymphoma? Only that appearance, it's lymphoma is more solid, more regular. This is well defined. I think you're talking about hemangioma versus hamartoma. Hamartomas also tend to extend beyond the liver border, beyond the splenic borders. So I would go with hemangioma in this case. Another example, a little bit of model enhancement. You can see the calcification present. And so cystic lesions with calcification in the spleen, you gotta be thinking about hemangioma and this patient's liver had multiple hemangiomas. And finally, another example, arterial face. Look at the bright blush there. That's a really good example. Well-defined, sharply marginated, washes out. There it is on cinematic, really a nice appearance. And this was also a hemangioma. You see the feeding vessel. So at times it's tricky. At times it's less tricky. I mentioned Klippel Chinani Weber. Look at these multiple splenic hemangiomas, okay? If I told you the patient was febrile, you could think about abscess. If I told you the patient had weight loss and fever, you could think about malignancy. So these are indeed all going to be possibilities. And patients with Klippel Chinani Weber, um, we need to... Uh, uh, recognize those patients also get the cysts in the lung and they get spontaneous pneumothoraces. So very nice example there. Now I mentioned finally hamartomas. They're uncommon. They're anomalous mixture of splenic elements. They're usually solitary, more common in tuberous sclerosis. The CT appearance, hypodense or isodense and non-contrast, enhancement with contrast, very well defined. In fact, they're better defined than hemangiomas. But the other thing about them is they tend to protrude beyond the spleen. So if you look at this case, image on your left, you see the lesion, but you see how it kind of like bulges out. Well defined sharp margination. Another example, look at this lesion coming posteriorly off the spleen. Just that shape. And then you see the enhancement, in this case, fairly homogeneous. Vessels are stretched and then it washes out, but you can see it's like exophytic appearance. So hemangiomas are always internal as are most lesions. This exophytic appearance is to me really, really suggestive of a hamartoma. Okay, so what about malignancies? Well, two main primaries, lymphoma is the most common and then angiosarcoma, and angiosarcoma is exceedingly rare, something we speak more about than C. And then of course, metastasis. Angiosarcomas are very vascular lesions. Here's a good example. Vascular lesion marked irregularity, ascites and carcinomatosis. Uh, angiosarcomas can spontaneously bleed, but you can see the extensive irregular enhancement. Angiosarcoma is a rare and aggressive malignancy. Uh, they are rapidly proliferating, prol proliferating highly infiltrative tumors, which spread quickly highly aggressive tumors. In terms of angiosarcomas, not many articles. This article, ill-defined heterogeneously enhancing splenic mass with areas of necrosis. Acute rupture is possible. Vascular mets are possible to liver, lungs, bone, are all well seen on CT. Uh, another article by Thompson, again, six patients in large spleen with a heterogeneous complex mass they replace the spleen. So, but aggressive, you're not making a mistake of calling this a hamartoma or hemangioma. These are aggressive enhancement, aggressive irregularity, and also early carcinomatosis. A more recent article by Tip Havang, most common primary malignant neoplasm of the spleen arises from the endothelial layer of the splenic blood vessels. They appear as a well-defined mass or can be infiltrating in appearance. Now, we used to talk about angiosarcomas and vinyl chloride exposure, but that's not the case with splenic uh, angiosarcomas. That's something you talk about with hepatic angiosarcomas. So again, just an important diagnosis. Uh, can be challenging. Again, one of the things with angiosarcomas, you can have spontaneous splenic rupture. Now, the amount of enhancement will depend on the amount of tuberal necrosis present, so very, very important. Now, as I mentioned, lymphoma, angiosarcomas are primary tumors. 
metastases are more common. Think melanoma, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Hematogenous spread, direct extension. Well, direct pancreas, kidney, colon, hematogenous is going to be something like melanoma. We talk about it, splenic mets can occur with widespread disease. Most common primaries, melanoma, breast, lung, ovary, stomach, prostate. Good example here, ovarian cancer, carcinomatosis, tumor implanted by tail of pancreas, and the tumor is also causing tumor implants on the spleen. Another example with implants on the splenic surface, ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is tumor implants on the spleen or on the liver, just sort of a classic type of appearance to think about. We talk about here with renal cell carcinoma. The patient has METs to the spleen and METs to the adrenal. And remember, renal cell carcinoma, specifically clear cell renal cell carcinoma, METs to pancreas, METs to spleen, METs to liver, METs to stomach, METs to soft tissue and muscle, all are typically hypervascular. So that can be helpful. Another example, neuroendocrine tumor of the lung, metastatic to the spleen, you can see it's extending through the spleen. There are METs to the right lower lung. You can see the extent of involvement. So again, metastasis are gonna be more common than a primary splenic lesion. We mentioned direct extension, and of course the classic thing is pancreatic cancer. Tail of the pancreas tumors invade the spleen. That does not make the patient unresectable because patients with distal pancreatic tumors can get a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. So the spleen involvement is important, but does not make somebody unresectable. So that's important. Here you see direct extension and infiltration. Unfortunately, there's also significant vascular involvement and involvement of the crews of the left hemidiaphragm. So direct extension from uh, pancreatic cancer is indeed going to be very common or not uncommon. And remember, direct extension, duodenum is pancreatic cancer as well, but this is the spleen. Here's a patient with recurrent gastric cancer with local recurrence, and so you see the implants on the splenic surface as well. So tumors that are local, like gastric cancer, primary can invade the spleen, or when they recur, can invade the spleen, as in this case, and you very nicely can see the diffuse infiltration. Now, we also talk about splenic involvement with diffuse infiltration. And with malignancies, we typically start with lymphoma, most common primary tumor of the spleen, but it's uncommon. Most of the time with lymphoma, the secondary splenic involvement, both in Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, in about 25% of cases. But sometimes you have primary splenic lesions. Solitary or multiple low-density lesions, you can see other organ involvement like liver, you can see nodes, but again, usually to me, the most difficult diagnosis in this patient with fever, could this be an abscess? I think when the lesions are multiple in a patient who is not immunosuppressed, then I think malignancy uh, over infection. Infiltration, beautiful example of infiltration of an enlarged spleen, B-cell lymphoma, just a really nice example. You can see it on the coronal views as well and very nicely showing you on the cinematic. And again, when you see infiltration, it doesn't necessarily need to be lymphoma, but that's what you should be thinking about. You can see infiltration with other processes, inflammatory processes. You can see with myelofibrosis, potential changes. But when you start seeing mass and infiltration, you better be thinking about malignancy. And here it is both on the cinematic and the standard imaging. Just a really, really nice example. Or in this case, large mass in the spleen pushing on the stomach. This was primary lymphoma. As you look more carefully in this case, you'll see that when you look down at the pancreas, there is also a tumor in the head of the pancreas. So lymphoma, B-cell, solid organ involvement, not uncommon. So we see solid organ involvement of the liver, spleen, as well as the pancreas. And the liver images aren't uh, enclosed. But very nice example, here's the coronal, okay? Now lymphoma, again, multi-organ is more common than primary lymphoma. Large axillary nodes, right internal mammary nodes, multiple liver lesions, extensive adenopathy, as well as splenic lesions. So you can see multifocal disease with multi-organ involvement, very nicely shown in this example. You can even see in this case, the accessory spleen is infiltrated by tumor, very nicely shown here as well. 
Another example, diffuse infiltration of the spleen, but there's also adenopathy present, extensive periodic nodes, and infiltration. So you can see arterial phase, or particularly venous phase, very nicely the perfusion changes of the spleen are seen. You see the infiltration. You're not going to confuse this infiltration with the moray pattern. Again, make sure you have venous phase imaging, but the moray pattern is going to be disturbed when you have infiltration by tumor. Another example here, extensive tumor in the spleen with extension and involvement of the pancreatic tail and peripancreatic region. So again, when I see involvement of the spleen, I look very carefully to look for other sites of disease. Am I talking with only primary splenic disease versus multi-organ, multi-system disease? And multi-system is going to be more common. So in this case, you can see nicely the periodic adenopathy, the encasement of the left renal vein, the encasement of the portal vein and SMV. And you can see that very nicely with the cinematic rendering as well. So multiple ways of looking at what tends to be a difficult problem, but very nicely shown in this example. Now, we also can look at a range of processes that involve the spleen as well. And what we should do is let's take a break for a moment and let's come back and pick it up here. I don't want to kind of converge all of the different differential diagnoses together. So let's take a break here and come back in a few minutes. Thanks very much. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.